Gentlemen, welcome back to the EOD, also known by my favorite greasy polyglot as uh, the Casa de Grisa. <laughs> I don't, I don't judge, partner. Everybody got to make a living uh, on Pap's blue ribbon smear and used French fry oil. Happens to the best of us. What we have here is a well, this is a transducer, but they call it a current to air converter. This, of course, is made by Foxborough. Foxborough got bought out by uh, Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric, you're huge in the PLC business, but uh, it's a massive, like, $50 billion French, French of all things, conglomerate, what also owns the Square D. So they're, they're huge in, in automation. And this uh, bygone age, the Foxborough Company Limited, La Salle, Quebec, Canada Derp, of all things, model E69. That's, uh, what comes after 69? Mouthwash. That, that joke could have been much worse. It could have been a model 6.9, which is a poor soldier what's afraid to get his bayonet bloody. At the same time, you prefer not to have your 69 interrupted by a period. And demonetized. Well, this is automation and process Lego. You get these parts from anywhere. You can get them from uh, Pep, 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 and, and Fuchs, which I uh, never had a lick of trouble with any of those other than just dying outright from uh, age and, and corrosion. But that's an interesting company too out of Germany. Real good stuff. But the CEO was a former designer. He didn't come up on the sales side. So, yeah. A little bit smaller, of course, than Schneider Electric, but huge, huge, huge in the instrumentation side, uh, Coriolis meters, mass flow meters, all that sort of process industry stuff. Um, this guy is intrinsically safe, and it is for 15 to 23 PSI. Of course, we get uh, because it's a transducer, it changes one form of energy to another form of energy, and it gets... Pressure in outputs 4 to 20 milliamps. Now you can see here from the patina of academic dust, this came out of the Pacific Vocational Institute, which of course now is uh, BCIT. <laughs> and academia being what it is, they didn't put the proper label on this. Now, why would you put a, a, a bad used part back on the or in a bin or whatever? But you know, it's kind of nice. My thank you, hats off, a long, short, and curly of it is. To the usual scumbags, what uh, picked this out of the scrap bin for me? Uh, friends in low places are my kind of people, but we can see it. What came out of academia because there is a missing G here, not functioning good. It should be NFG, so <laughs> not quite super clear on that. But we can see how long that's been sitting on a shelf. I guess just waiting for it to uh, self heal. Uh, we would. That is to say, it's probably come up to temperature for long enough. We don't need to leave it on the healing bench for any longer. We can get right into the meat of her. And part of this intrinsically safe certification, that would be Class 1, Div 1, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to look that up. There's Class 2, Div 2, and all sorts of stuff. But that's just the testing to make sure you're not going to blow yourself sky high when you connect this up to power. So this would be good for refineries, process industries, gas stations. Um, oh, uh, paint booths. Paint booths got to be intrinsically safe as well. So here we see there is not a lick of electronicals. It's electromechanical. There's a special boyhood glee associated with electromechanical devices. And I think that's because you can see how it functions. It's not a bunch of magical pixies going in and out of ICs and doing this, that, the other thing. We can see what is happening here. You look at this now. Extremely expensive part, bronze bellows. This is like almost a Borden tube, a linear Borden tube. We uh, board and tube, of course, you put pressure in and it lengthens out, not changes the gauge. In this case, we don't uh, we don't lengthen it out. Well, we do lengthen it out, but only in 
it, linearly. It's a bellows. It, so looks like power, rather air, goes in here, pressurizes this little bellows. The little bellows actuates this dingus end. This dingus end hits in here, which must be some sort of rheostat. Now we can change the zero point on that rheostat so that we get four milliamps, uh, which is the floating zero, at the correct level at zero PSI or whatever you want to set it at. And then all this guy is doing is pushing this around and you can see how very little stroke there is on that. Now we got the actuator out and they don't build them like this anymore. Look at how beefy these brackets are for no other reason than to mitigate vibration, It'll add some structural rigidity to the whole assembly here. This looks like we put air in here and we get the gross movement. Now this is cantilevered out, so any kind of any kind of little tweak on this bellows is gonna move this out. But look at this. This itself, this little tube, was almost like a, well, it's a nozzle. It's a nozzle, look at this. Air goes in as well. Now we are missing the bottom platen that gets connected up in order to do what it needs to do, but we can sort of infer that this would be the course, the course gain or the course measurement, and then this would be the fine measurement. We get air blasting onto the rheostat down here. I would assume this is a rheostat, and then there's a there's a contact switch as well. So actually, that blowing air might just be for damping, dampening, you know, whichever one, so that it takes out the oscillations in the system. We got the rheostat, or what I'm calling the rheostat, oh, just a wee bit of Springworks, and we found the smoking gun. Students <laughs> got their hands on this and uh, beat the shit out of it. You can see, because it's intrinsically safe, all the wires got to be sealed right up. And when you turn this gland in and out, it twists... <laughs> twists the wires up like a pretzel and eventually breaks them off. So that, I think, would be the best explanation as to why this thing no longer works. We see a big coil of wire in there, some sort of wiper. So we're going to go ahead and take that out. Hopefully it doesn't spring and spring and all over the place. Because it'd be interesting to put some current through this see what happens. Oop. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Ink December. Ink des. Ink des. December 1979. Jesus. That's older than some of my underwear. <sighs> Note the use of the word some. Yeah. Hey, uh, Okay, okay, we're getting there. Well, that's cool. You don't see that very often where you have diametrically opposed fasteners. Normally you come in from the same side, but I guess what that allows them to do is use the same plate on both sides. Huh? Pretty smart. Pretty smart. Instead of having two plates, they go ahead and just use the one plate and, and have one fastener this way and one fastener that way. We're in like sin. This is cooler as frig, boys. Brilliant. Okay, we got a couple of diodes there. We got a big old coil of wire going through the middle of what can be assumed is a magnet, a big magnet. Now, how is this going to work when we actuate this? It's going to change the impedance, right? You would think that's what happens. But if this magnet is actually axially magnetized, there's no difference in flux from over here to over here so that doesn't make a sense unless unless let me it's better if I show you so here's a magnet with a north and a south pole and we have a look at that north and a south pole but if we have a diametrically magnetized magnet it's completely different now we have a north and a south pole on one face. That's what I think is going on here. We have a north and a south pole on one face. And that way, when we 
change the angle of the dangle here on this here coil that 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 puts it through a different flux it changes the impedance of this coil itself and we will get more or less current through it so what i'll do now is we'll just go ahead and hook up the crappy power supply as best we can it's barely regulated i don't know if it'll go down to 20 milliamps but if we let the smoke out um, so be it okay i got the puke meter out and the source is regulated at roughly 30 milliamps it well anyway we'll see what happens something's a moving okay so because the magnetic field of the coil didn't align perfectly with the magnetic field of the magnet. That is because it must be diametrically magnetized instead of axially magnetized. Now if we push on this, it wants to go back whence it came. So there's a little leaf spring there. And if we drop it off, yeah, it goes back to the neutral position. So now this should change the impedance even though it's DC, it should change the impedance as we move it around. It does a little bit, but not 4 to 20 milliamps worth. So what is going on there? I see there's some... Off that magnet wire... There's a chunk of real shiny stuff. I wonder if this coil is shorted. So it doesn't have the total flux that it should. Maybe only half the flux it should. Somebody got in there with the meat hook abortion and gave her a what fur. This time it wasn't yours truly. I wonder for tits and pickles if we can... Uh, oh, there. <laughs> uh, I should have done that in the firstly. If you can see right there, diametrically opposed. Now that is big one clunker of a magnet so harvesting the carcass off this will be rather useful and we'll energize we can see no we can't see anything because the field is in this plane is in the other plane but i just put a little input impedance on or a resistor 100 ohms or 200 or whatever was in the book here whatever come out of the super super useful if you're on the spork fun or the uh, seed bay seed studio get yourself ah oh, they probably got them on the aliexpress all the usual scumbags i digress still not verkin so either i am uh well i'm not well versed in these analog instruments that don't have any electronicals in them normally you feed them the voltage like these guys where are you where the fuck do you go these guys you feed them the voltage any voltage and they output four to 20 milliamps this i think is a little more finicky you got to get the right voltage going to her you got to tweak it a little bit so in in that case you know other than being super interesting because it's electromechanical maybe a bit more of a pain in the arse is it more reliable than an electronic version definitely not more moving parts more failure modes in this case a beautiful example of a bygone era wherein you could get instrumentation what worked on mechanics incredible 1979 thanks for watching keep your dick in a vice